How many of you have ever prayed for a friend? Raise your hand. Okay. Unanimous. Uh, why did you pray for your friend? God's will be done. So these four verses, just four, okay? Jim, four verses. <laughs> you did really good. You did really good with the embellishment part. <laughs> Only four verses of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians read this morning. And they constitute a prayer for a friend. This is not exactly the most flowery prose nor profound theology found in Scripture. It's, it's just a simple prayer from someone who's praying for a group of people that he considers his friends. The Apostle Paul is the prayer, and the Thessalonians are the prayees. Nothing particularly earth-shaking here. It's just a nice prayer of blessing and thanksgiving. <clears throat> offered by a man who felt affection for, for these folks with whom he had helped start a church. Now, Steven Spielberg would have a hard time making a movie out of this scripture passage. It certainly doesn't rate up there with some of the action adventure of the Old Testament or the apocalyptic drama of the book of Revelation we read from last week. This scripture doesn't quite have the poetic beauty of the Psalms nor the bedrock wisdom of the Proverbs. It doesn't give us the clever twist of a parable, nor the heart-pounding passion of a crucifixion or a resurrection story. It's just a prayer for some friends. Even among Paul's writings, it's, it doesn't really stand out particularly. He doesn't have the theological sophistication of his writing to the Romans, nor the penetrating discourse of what he had to say to the Corinthians. It's just a prayer for some friends. It's, it's Paul doing what most of us have done hundreds, perhaps even thousands of times. Some of us every day. Now, if you were out there or if I was out there where you are this morning, I might be thinking, you know, preacher, here we are. It's the first Sunday of Advent. We're just four weeks away from, from Christmas, which is the, the most high holiest day uh, of the year for Christians. It looks like, preacher, you could have picked a little more dramatic scripture to have read. And indeed, I, I could have selected the gospel reading for today, which is from Luke's gospel. It's one of those... Uh, Jesus coming back kind of uh, scriptures, you know, where the, the moon is going to turn blood red and uh, there's going to be earthquakes and uh, there's going to be signs in the heavens and the roaring of the seas and people will be fainting and the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power. Lots of drama. Lots of drama. But instead I'm just giving you this. A prayer for a friend. Pretty ordinary, huh? We don't seem to have much tolerance for the ordinary in our world today. Um, I got thinking about the birth of children. Oh, babies are born every day, aren't they? I don't know how many will be, probably be born out of AMED uh, today, uh, Rebo Hospital. I'm sure there'll be several <laughs> babies born. Uh, that news won't make it into the newspaper, likely, or the evening news. Uh, it'll be exciting for the families, hopefully very exciting for the families, although we continue every year to hear stories that a baby's born and ends up in a trash can somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's an ordinary, it's an ordinary thing, the birth of a child. Nothing like the McCoy babies. Do you remember them from Northern Iowa? Uh, back in the late 90s, seven of them born to one mama. Uh, and uh, their story made it on Dateline, NBC, CNN, uh, all the major networks. Their, their pictures were on the cover of Newsweek and Time and almost every major newspaper in our country. Uh, now, 
Now, not that the McCoy children didn't deserve the attention they were getting, getting their time in the sun, but I'm sure there's lots of parents of single births or even twins or triplets who would, who would like a lifetime supply of disposable diapers or a new van or a new home awaiting them when they bring their babies home or the state in which they were born promising to cover their college education for all, all of their children. Uh, but most births of most babies go pretty unnoticed by most of the world. The birth of a firstborn son to a young couple from a village called Nazareth, which took place in an insignificant Palestinian city called Bethlehem some 2,000 plus years ago, <clears throat> went virtually unnoticed at the time. Despite the gospel accounts of angel choirs and shining stars, other than a few shepherds and a handful of barn animals, the rest of the world paid no attention to the birth of this child. Just another child. Another mouth to feed, another head to count. Oh, later on, King Herod, remember him? The egomaniac leader of their time. He evidently caught wind of something, and he went on one of his royal temper tantrums, you remember, and ordered the, the murder of all the boy babies under age two. But for the most part, the birth of this child was ignored. Just the birth of a baby. Happens every day, ordinary thing. Just a prayer for a friend. Do it all the time, no big deal. We don't have much patience or regard these days for, for the ordinary. We want dramatic. We want spectacular. We want entertaining. We want big and bright and flashy and glamorous. We want scandal and controversy, stories about the lifestyles of the rich and the famous. But most of life, the overwhelming majority of life, doesn't fall into those categories. Perhaps this is why God chose the birth of a baby as his way to enter the world. Just the birth of a baby. Now he could have come on a golden chariot, sweeping down from the sky. He could have ridden on the wings of angels or descended on a cloud. But he came as a baby, born in a back alley stable, to parents nobody had ever heard of. As one theologian so graphically describes, God snuck down the back stairs of the world one night. God came, and hardly anybody noticed. God's people didn't notice, because they were too busy looking for a military messiah. They wanted a political leader to fix their problems. The innkeeper, you remember the innkeeper? He didn't notice because, you see, he was busy trying to make a profit off his busiest season of the year. And the Herods of the world didn't notice, at least at first, because they were preoccupied with protecting their turf. And the religious establishment, they didn't notice God had come. They were tied up guarding their laws and protecting their institutions. You see, God was in their world, and they didn't recognize God. God was in their world, and only a scared young couple and a few lowly shepherds and two or three astrologers seemed to have even a clue that God was up to something through the birth of this seemingly ordinary child. God came, and very few folks knew it. I wonder if we will know him when he comes into our world. Have you thought about that? I wonder if we will be able to recognize God when God enters our reality. Or I wonder if many of us are not like ex-president Jimmy Carter who confessed in one of his books, Living Faith, that for much of his life, he didn't recognize Jesus because he was looking for someone far different 
than who Jesus is. He said, when I turned to the Gospels, the Jesus I met had a very different way of life from the one I was building for myself and my family. For you see, Jesus had no money, no possessions, no house, remember? No house, homeless. Birds of the air have nests, foxes have been, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. He turned away from his mother and his brothers and his sisters. He was abandoned in time of trouble by his friends and followers. And when he died, still a young man, can you imagine? Not many noticed. How could this be my God? President Carter goes on to say, I, I began to realize that when I envisioned a supreme being, he was more like Muhammad, the founder of Islam, a, a patently successful man in earthly terms, a powerful warrior, a political leader, a founder of a great institutional religion. This was in many ways the opposite of the Jesus of the Gospels or the image of the suffering servant in Isaiah. Remember that image? who Christians identify with as being the Christ, a physically unattractive, uneloquent, scorned, rejected individual. He said, the more I thought about the discrepancy between my image of God and the image of the gospel, the more it tortured me, not for Jesus' sake, but for my sake, because I was so different from the divine human being I claimed to worship. I wonder... If we frequently miss seeing God when he's in our midst because we have such low tolerance for the ordinary things of life, we choose to ignore rather than value the ordinary things of life. Christian writer Richard Foster tells the story of one summer as a teenager when he was in Alaska on a mission trip. He was helping build a school and one day, he was trying to dig a trench for a sewer line. And he said it was back-breaking work there in the frozen tundra of Alaska. And he said a native Alaskan came up to him, a man whose face and hands displayed the leathery toughness of many winters. And he, and he watched Foster for just a little while do his work, trying to dig the, the trench for the sewer line. and the. The Alaskan man finally spoke up simply and profoundly, and he said to Richard Foster, he said, Son, you are digging a ditch to the glory of God. Mm. Foster said, Because of my friend's words, I dug with all my might. For every shovelful full of dirt was a prayer to God. God comes into our world on a daily basis. God enters the moments of our every days and our nights. God comes when we're digging ditches and when we're cleaning toilets and when we're mopping <coughs> floors. He comes when we're painting walls. He comes when we're singing music that we can't read. He, he comes when we're su serving soup and sandwiches and, and uh, collard greens, I think, coming up in a little bit. He comes when we carry a pie to a neighbor who's grieving. He comes when we're at work, at our jobs, when we're in the, on the playground, at school. God comes when we take time to speak a kind word to the clerk of the Walmart. He comes when we visit the hospital room or the nursing care facility or the shut-in. God comes into the world as we pray for our friends. I, I came across a writer, uh, and I'm sorry I don't even know her name, but she wrote an article entitled, When God Chooses to Come Through the Ordinary and Calls Us to Where We Already Are. She said, God wants willing hearts, not just loud voices. She says, I found misconceptions among Christians regarding leadership that, that only the people that are, that
that are truly serving God are those who are bold and extroverted and popular and I've got my life all together and vocational ministry type of people. And she says, as much as I've grown into a lot of those things, the times in which I've seen God work most in my life weren't always when I was on a platform. <coughs> there were times when things were tough and all I had was to give myself because you see, God uses us in our weaknesses and our failings. He uses us when we're quiet and humble. He uses us in our vulnerability over our strength. He uses us when we, we make things about Him before we ever make it about our position. He uses us when we're scrubbing floors and painting walls and hanging lights and writing cards. He uses us when we're serving our families and our communities, even when other things seem so much more glamorous and exciting. For God is the one who qualifies us to do what he calls us to, not the other way around. Amen. He uses the small, seemingly insignificant things in our world and in our lives. As we submit to him and he prepares us for what's coming next. Hmm. Yes, God comes into the world when we do simple things like praying for our friends. Will we know him? Deliver us, Lord, from our obsession and addiction to the big and the bold and the flashy, and restore in us a deep appreciation for the way you bless our lives and connect with us and make your presence known through the things we label ordinary. Interacting with our friends at church, sharing a meal together, walking in a Christmas parade, singing songs, offering prayers.